So we are going to talk about the orbit stabilizer theorem, which shows a very important property of group actions. So let's suppose that we have some group G, some set A, and a group action where G acts on A. And let's pick a specific element of that set. In that case, we can consider the set G times A, which is referring to the set of elements of the form G times A, where G is an element of the group. So it's all possible elements of the form G times A for this specific element. This is called the orbit of the element A. We're also going to look at another set, which is called the stabilizer of A. It's written as G sub A. And this is the set of elements of the group such that G times A equals A. So it's the set of elements in the group where when we apply them to A, it leaves A the same. Now the first thing that we're going to do here is check that the stabilizer is a subgroup of the original group G. First we can check whether the identity is in the stabilizer. One of the parts of the definition of a group action is that we always have E times A equals A, and therefore E has to be in the stabilizer of A by definition. Next let's suppose that G is in the stabilizer of A. By definition, that means G times A equals A, and we can multiply by G inverse on both sides. So we get G inverse times G times A equals G inverse times A. Now over here, because group actions are associative, we can write this as G inverse G times A equals G inverse times A, but this is just the identity. We know E times A equals A, and therefore this just becomes E times A. So we get A equals G inverse times A. Now the conclusion here is that if G is in the stabilizer of A, then we also have G inverse times A equals A, meaning we have G inverse being in the stabilizer of A. The third condition we need to check is closure under multiplication. So let's suppose G and H are both in the stabilizer of A. Then what is GH times A? Well, we know a group action is always associative, which means that we can write this as G times H times A. Now we said that H is in the stabilizer of A, which means H times A always has to be A. So this gives us G times A. But we know G is also in the stabilizer of A, which means that G times A is again equal to A. So we get GH times A equals A, and therefore GH is in the stabilizer of A. So three conclusions here. The identity is in the stabilizer. It's closed under inverses. So if G is in the stabilizer, G inverse also is. And it's closed under multiplication. Therefore, we can conclude that G sub A is a subgroup of G. Now that we know some basic properties of the stabilizer, we're going to take a closer look at how the group action works within the orbit of A. Remember that, by definition, every element in the orbit of A can be written as G times A. So what happens if we take some element in the orbit and we multiply it by another element of the group? So we take H times this element of the orbit. Well, group actions are associative, which means that we can write this as HG times A. But notice what happens here is this times A seems like it's kind of just sitting off on the right side, but when we multiply H times G times A, all that really matters is we take H times G. That's what we're getting as a result, and then the times A kind of gets tacked on at the end. Because group actions are associative, Whenever we multiply a group element on, we can just consider the multiplication within the group itself. This H times G is just from the original group. And then after that, we multiply it on to A. So because of this associativity rule, whenever we do any kind of multiplication in this group acting on A, we're really just multiplying elements of the group and then putting times A at the end. If we had a more complicated sequence of multiplication, say we had k times g inverse times h times g times a. And this is group action here, group action here, group action here. 
we don't really have to consider A at all. We don't have to look at the set. Because of associativity, this is K G inverse H G times A. And this whole product is just in the group. This is multiplying group elements. And it has nothing to do with the action at all. The action only happens right at the end after we multiply all of the group elements. So one question you might ask is what is the difference between looking at this group action and just looking at the group itself? What is the difference between multiplying in this group action and just multiplying in the original group? There's one difference, and that is that the group elements don't need to stay distinct. In other words, it's possible for us to have g not equal to the identity and g times a equals a. And in fact, this occurs when we have an element of the stabilizer by definition. So the difference between this group action and just group multiplication is that we can have a non-identity element that has g times a equals the identity times a. So when it comes to multiplying elements, the difference between multiplying in a group action and multiplying in the original group is that sometimes we can have group elements that aren't equal to each other, but g times a still equals h times a. So one important question when we're looking at an orbit in a group action is when do we have g times a equal to h times a? We want to solve for when this is true for specific values of g and h. To do that, we can start by multiplying by h inverse on both sides. So we get h inverse times g times a equals h inverse times h times a. Now again, group actions are associative. So over here, we're going to get h inverse h times a, and this is the identity. So on the right side, we get e times a, which is just a. On the left side, we can bring these two together. So we get h inverse g times a. Now this condition looks just like the condition for an element to be in the stabilizer. h inverse g times a equals a. So what we can conclude from this is that h inverse g has to be in the stabilizer of a. Now when this condition is true, we know one property of cosets is that if h inverse g is inside the subgroup g sub a, then the coset h inverse g times g sub a is just equal to the original subgroup. And if we multiply on the left here by h, what we get is g times g sub a equals h times g sub a. So the condition for having g times a equal to h times a is that g and h are in the same coset of the stabilizer. This fact here gives us a really interesting way of thinking about a group action. Instead of thinking about a group acting on the original set A, what I'm going to do is consider a group acting on what we'll call G mod G sub A. Now, we don't know if the stabilizer is a normal subgroup. So this is not talking about a quotient group. Instead, it's just the set of cosets of G sub A. So inside of this set here, we're going to have g sub a, x g sub a, y g sub a, and so on. Now, in this group action, if we define the multiplication to be g times g sub a equals just the coset g g sub a, the condition that we derived right here says g times a equals h times a if and only if g times g sub a equals h times g sub a. So notice that the element A in the original set is working in the exact same way as the stabilizer of A when we look at this group action. Regardless of which group elements G and H we choose, they're going to multiply in the same way because the defining property of a group action is when do we have two different group elements that give us the same result in the set. And we know by definition that the stabilizer of A is just the set of elements that leave A the same. So if an element leaves A the same, it's also going to leave the stabilizer the same. Then these two group actions are going to work the same way.
Now one consequence of that is that if we have two group actions that work exactly the same way, they need to have the same number of elements. Remember that the elements in the orbit g times a are just all of the things of the form g times a. These are the elements. So if two elements in the orbit are equal, that's the same thing as the group elements g and h being in the same coset. If we want these two elements to be distinct, if we want g times a to not equal h times a, they need to be in different cosets. So one result we can get from that is the number of distinct elements, the number of elements in this orbit that are not equal to each other, is the same as the number of cosets of g sub a. And we write that as the index of g sub a in g using this notation. And for finite groups, so if this stabilizer has a finite number of elements, then we can write this size as the size of g divided by the size of the stabilizer of a. And this result is called the orbit stabilizer theorem. So because group actions always have to be associative, whenever we multiply in a group action, it's the same thing as multiplying the group elements. And so every group action is going to work in a very similar way, because no matter what product we look at, it has to be the same product in the original group. So the only thing that makes two group actions work in different ways is that sometimes we can have distinct group elements that give us the same element in the orbit of a. And we saw that the only way to have g times a equal h times a is if g and h are in the same coset of the stabilizer, where the stabilizer is just the set of elements that do nothing. If we want to find the number of distinct elements in the orbit, then that's going to be given by the number of distinct cosets, because two elements are only going to be different if the cosets are different. And so the size of g times a is the number of cosets of the stabilizer in the group, which is given by the size of g divided by the size of the stabilizer. The last thing we're going to do here is look at a specific example of how we can apply the orbit stabilizer theorem. Let's look at the action of S5 acting on S5 by conjugation. So that means that if we take some element tau and we multiply it onto sigma, this is going to be conjugating by tau. So tau, sigma, tau, inverse. And let's consider a specific orbit in this group action. In particular, let's consider S5 multiplying onto the transposition 1, 2. We want to ask how many elements are there in this orbit. Now I have another video that explains how conjugation works in the symmetric group, so you can check the link in the description for that. The way that conjugation works is if we have some permutation tau and we multiply it onto 1, 2, this is going to be conjugation, so tau times 1, 2 times tau inverse. This is the same thing as tau of 1 and then tau of 2. So this is the cycle notation for this conjugate element. So if we want to find the number of distinct elements in the orbit, it's going to be the number of elements that look like this. But remember that tau is an arbitrary permutation in S5, which means that tau of 1 and tau of 2 can be anything we want. In other words, we can choose any transposition, any two elements to put inside of this 2 cycle. So the number of ways that we can pick two elements, of course that's going to be 5 choose 2. 5 is the number of elements that we get to permute, and 2 is the number that we want to choose to put in this transposition. And it ends up that 5 choose 2 is equal to 10, which means that the size of this orbit, tau onto the permutation 1, 2, that orbit has 10 elements. So we found the size of the orbit directly, now we want to try using the orbit stabilizer theorem. But in order to do that, we need to know what the stabilizer looks like. So the stabilizer, S5 sub 1, 2, that's going to be the set of elements tau in the symmetric group such that this conjugation, tau times 1, 2, which we can write as tau of 1, tau of 2, this needs to be equal to the permutation 1, 2. 
Now, one way that we can do that is to have tau of 1 equal 1 and tau of 2 equal 2. But in fact, we also have that 2, 1 is equal to 1, 2. So these two transpositions are just the same thing. Either way, 1 and 2 are going to get swapped. So we get two different options for how we're going to move around the elements 1, 2. We can either leave them the same or we can switch them. But we actually have more freedom than that because we can also look at the other elements. We can look at the numbers 3, 4, and 5. Because this conjugation is only moving 1 and 2 to tau of 1 and tau of 2. But if tau of 3 is not 3, that doesn't matter because it's not going to show up in our final permutation. So the elements 3, 4, and 5, we can switch them around however they want, and the conjugation is going to stay the same. So how many different ways are there to permute three elements? That's going to be given by 3 factorial. And so the number of elements in this stabilizer is 2 times 3 factorial, which is equal to 12. So then what is the size of the orbit, s5 times 1, 2? By the orbit stabilizer theorem, the size of s5 times the element 1, 2, this orbit, is equal to the size of s5 divided by the size of the stabilizer, s5 sub 1, 2. Now the size of s5 is 5 factorial, which is 120. And down here, we just calculated that the size of the stabilizer is 2 times 3 factorial, which is 12. And 120 over 12 gives us 10. So by the orbit stabilizer theorem, we get that the size of this orbit is 10, which is exactly the same as the result that we got directly. So that's how we use the orbit stabilizer theorem to find information about group actions. Thank you.